good evening. Welcome to everyone. And thank you very much for coming along to this fourth QCA panel event. Um, this is a combined event with the three SBAs, Combar, Chancery Bar Association and Tech Bar. Um, as I say, it's a format that we've run before. So I will just quickly introduce that. The format is um, that I will run through some slides, which are a very brief introduction to people who have perhaps not yet encountered the form and the application process. Um, and then we will move swiftly on to the panel discussion. Uh, we do have the chat function, Q&A function operative this evening. So if you want to send any questions in, please do use that function and we will try and pick them up and uh, put them to the panel at the relevant time. A um, couple of, of some housekeeping matters. Um, I'm chairing the discussion and I will try to ensure that each panel member is introduced or they will introduce themselves uh, so that you know who is speaking. Uh, but also for the purposes of editing of the video, there will be a video created and it will go up on the SBA websites. But um, for reasons that relate to the control of the content of what the judges say, we will be editing those parts out of the evening's uh, tape. So um, it is very significant that everybody is here. We do have 193 attendees listed and I will uh, get cracking. Um, I think you're all used to Zoom etiquette, so um, I won't uh, take any more time over that. Could we have the slides up, please? So very briefly, the introduction, and I'll just go on to the panel next slide to introduce everyone. We have Mrs. Justice O'Farrell, who is the judge in charge of the Technology and Construction Court. Mrs. Justice Cockrell, who is the judge in charge of the Commercial Court. We have Mrs. Justice Bacon, who sits in the Chancery Division. We have two members from the QCA panel, Andrew Walker QC, who is one of the barrister members, and Russell Wallman, who is the Chief Executive. We then have five panel members who are recent silk uh, appointees. They are still waiting, I understand, a couple of weeks before they are officially fledged and able to use the um, QC, but I've uh, jumped the gun and put them up already on the slide. Uh, I'm at the bottom, um, Sean Merchandani. Shall we go on to the next slide, please? The plan for this evening, I'll do some uh, quick revision of the key resources and then a brief overview of the most significant or key parts of the application. And then we'll go on to the panel discussion Q&A, which will focus on these uh, six issues. Next slide, please. The key resources, these are um, where you will be spending a lot of your time when you're making the application. There's obviously the website, the application form. There is guidance on the uh, website for the 12 case requirements, assessments and getting assessors, explanations of what is in the, incomp the competencies and the, the, the final page that has to be completed. Um, there are also useful uh, res a further resource which are profiles of newly appointed QCs which are fairly lengthy but gives you a, a good grounding in what previous applicants have thought about the process and um, what put them off or what they felt could be improved. There is also a report on the previous year competition and another key resource not so available on the website is successful applicants forms and case table. I will be bringing a, a case table onto a slide very shortly. Next slide, please. This is the QCA panel for this current competition. Um, as you can see, there are lay members, retired judge members, a solicitor member, two solicitor members, two barrister members. And uh, for the interview, you are likely to have a barrister member or one legally qualified member and one lay member. Now, going on to the, um, the essential starting point, you will see throughout these slides that I have underlined the word evidence. Could I have the next slide, please? 
Uh, that is because the form and the process is all about putting together the evidence of what you have in your um, practice and in your experience to warrant uh, being awarded the Queen's Council appellation. Um, this is the starting point of what they are looking for, strong and consistent evidence of excellence in each of the competencies in cases of substance complexity or particular difficulty or sensitivity. There is then um, a, a, an explanation that is included on the uh, website. Next slide, please. So those are the competencies, the five competencies, understanding using the law, advocacy, written and oral, falls under one competency, working with others, diversity and integrity. Next slide. As I said, what is required, the key word is the evidence. And in order to be appointed, you will see that there is a, a difference in weighting. The applicants must demonstrate strong evidence of excellence in both A, which is understanding and using the law, and B, written and oral advocacy. They must also demonstrate strong evidence of excellence in either C, working with others, or D, diversity, and evidence of excellence in the other competency. One can see the um, additional weighting on understanding and using the law and advocacy. Next slide. So what is required? Where are these sources of evidence? Um, it's your, your application form, of course, which is uh, the list of the important cases that you have done, ideally 12. The form also contains a important section, which is a narrative description of your practice. That is uh, the place where you can put in all the evidence that indicates why your practice is not quite like anybody else's. And that might be where you can best explain why you don't have 12 cases or why your cases span more than the previous three years. I should point out that um, the QCA have indicated that for this coming competition, the um, cases can date from 2017 onwards. So it's a four year uh, period. It covers your self-assessment of your competencies and of course your potential assessors. Next slide. So the 12 cases, this is, um, as I say, what is required in terms of your cases together with a note of your role as an advocate in the case and the assessors whom you would expect to comment upon them. And then what they are looking for demonstration of the competencies in those cases. They will have regard to the case, your role, the degree of challenge and how you dealt with it. Um, a distinction is drawn between the run of the mill cases, but there may be immediate consequences for the client and those cases which present with unusual novel or unforeseen complexities or have consequences beyond the case. Should we move on to the next slide? These are examples of um, substantial cases that are included in the form. I think every single member on the panel who's just done the um, application will testify to the fact that there is a vast range more of cases which will be suitable and will pass as one of the substantive cases. Uh, I think that is going to be something that we will just debate um, later. Next slide. The description of your practice, as I said, there's this section where you give a narrative description of your practice. And this really is your opportunity to speak directly to the panel that will be assessing your application so that they can understand your practice as unique as it is. And if you can't list 12, it does say explain fully. Um, I know that all these sections of the form actually have a character count. So the explain fully has to be fitted into the character count, which is a, um, an exercise, a mental exercise in itself. Um, shall we, uh, just one point on this, uh, the, the limitation to it being three years previously and four years um, in this current competition um, is indicated that that is because of assessors memories of earlier cases may have faded and it, it's certainly um, 
uh, appeared as a question before as to whether that still applies when you are able to provide material relating to that hearing. Should we go to the next slide? So the assessments that are used from the 12 cases, there are 12 judicial assessors, not just high court or more senior judges. You can include arbitrators and tribunal chairs. You can include county court judges. The panel takes four assessments, one of which will be nominated by the applicant. Um, unless there is no judge involved, for example, settlement negotiations. So the assumption that it has to be 12 judges, it couldn't really be more wrong. 12 practitioner assessors, those are the leading or opposing counsel in the cases, and the panel will take three assessments, including one nominated by the applicant, and then six professional client assessors, um, or at least six, it says, uh, instructing solicitors, legal counsel, and so on. And again, the panel will take two assessments and one can be nominated. Next slide, please. So on to the panel views and um, when is it time to apply? Can I start with Claire Packham? Claire, do you have something to say about when, when it's too early or too late to apply? Sure. Um, and it's a difficult call to make and it will be different for every individual. But uh, you need to have in mind the balancing act between keeping an eye on your cases. And when you've had a good case, you've been in trial, you think that judge would be supportive in the comments that they would make for you. And you have a, a number of other cases which can stack up, then all of that is going to go in one side of the scales. On the other side, you don't necessarily want to go too early. And being a senior junior with good quality cases is a good furrow to plough for you know, a reasonable amount of time. So you do have to, to balance it up. I was in a, a, this strange situation of having been about to apply three years ago. And then due to personal circumstances, it was not something that I was able to do. And I look back now and I see those three years and the cases that I've been in during that period. And I'm very glad that in fact, I've applied when I have and done it now. And I've had the benefit of that, that extra time as a senior junior and being led in some very big cases which have given me um, a bit more perspective so from my personal view uh, I think actually having waited a little bit longer will mean that I start stronger going into silk and I'm quite glad for it. Thank you. Um, Simon can I ask you a question what was it about your practice or your career that made you think it was the right time for you to apply? Thanks Joel. Um, I think as Claire said it is a judgment call to make and I think I got to a stage where you sort of step back and you look at the quality of the cases that you're doing. And I think for my practice area, financial services, I think I had this sense that the quality of the cases um, was of a sufficient sort of weightiness. Um, on a number of the cases, I was against silks. And I'd also had a number of sort of outcomes in those cases, which they were themselves noteworthy. And I think the combination of all those sort of got me starting to think that actually maybe it is now is the time to start thinking about this. Um, I think there's also a practical issue actually, because as you go into silk, as you'd imagine, there's less unallocated work. So I think one thing you have to ask yourself is, well, actually, do you have a body of solicitors that you think will continue to instruct you as you move into silk? And I think weighing those in the round, I think I sort of came to the view that actually the time for me was right. And um, anybody else very happy for you to jump in here. Did you, did somebody find that it was a, a useful thing to speak with their clerk about this aspect or was it rather more of a personal decision? Can I ask Nicola? Oh, Miriam, Miriam's volunteering. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah, I, I, did, I did look externally because I it, the decision, it's obviously a big one. For me, it was looming on and off and I'd kick the can down the road and I'd think about it and then push it off again. And I think I adopted a pretty cautious approach with hindsight, probably too cautious based on the fact that 
as you said, Sean, that the list of substantial cases seems to indicate that the bar is very high indeed in terms of substance. And if you're not in the Supreme Court and Court of Appeal on a kind of biweekly basis, then um, it's going to be difficult. So I looked externally and what helped me to make the decision was speaking to my clerk um, and having quite a long candid chat with him. Um, uh, speaking to other members of chambers who were generous enough to give me their forms because I found it really helps to see the process because one hears it's so gruelling. So seeing the forms and seeing how the evidence is packaged, even if it's in relation to a different practice area, I found helpful. Um, and I had a pre-meeting with a consultant where I sat down with him and went through 12 cases and he gave me a steer as to whether he thought I was ready. And all of that in combination galvanised the decision and, and helped me make it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nicola, I was just about to ask you uh, as to what was your trigger for feeling that you were ready for the for the role? Well, I think it's a combination, as Miriam said, of you looking at your own case work that you've done in the previous three or four years and forming your own view that, yes, I have the confidence to go forward and will have a, a following. But also, I did find it really useful speaking to people who had just applied, but also more senior members of chambers and other people within the bar that I'd worked with, just to get their steer as to whether, whether they felt that I was at the right time in my career to, to make the next move to this challenge or not. Um, and I think it's really important to look at the form because it is daunting and you do hear these horror stories, but once you sort of see and look at your own cases and, and match it against, you sometimes are pleasantly surprised that you have more to say than you think you might have had otherwise. So I, I think it's a combination of your own personal confidence to apply and also taking soundings from others, which is an important part of the process. Uh, thank you. And I think we'll, we'll address the other question whilst we're here. The, the, the question in essence is, can county court trials be cases of substance? Um, perhaps I should ask the QCA barrister panel member and Russell Warman, the chief executive, this. Um, Andrew, may I ask you first? Well, I'll, I'll let Russell go first and then I'll give you a panelist perspective. Um, well, the, the short answer is that they can be in theory, um, but they're probably not very likely to be. I mean, the, the, the thing which most obviously makes a case suitable or your or a hearing in a case suitable uh, is if it's a case or a hearing that might easily have been done by a SIL. Now that's, that's if you like, the gold standard. Being opposed by a SIL obviously helps. But if it's the sort of hearing that nobody um, who didn't have more money would send than sense would possibly instruct a SIL, then it's unlikely to be much used for your purpose. So uh, my impression is that only a small proportion of county court work is likely to qualify. But it's not none. It's not no county court work. And can, I mean, can I uh, put a, a panelist perspective to that? Um, particularly, um, this question comes from someone with a with a practice in Chancery outside London. Um, if I was looking to assess that sort of practice, I would expect to see an assessment from one of the Section Nine One judges dealing with Chancery work wherever it is you practice. One sense, it doesn't really matter <clears throat> whether that case was in the county court or the high court, because it would be the same judge. And of course, the way ca cases are dealt with out of London, it could, it, it's probably irrelevant which court it was in. It, it would be the same judge. Um, but uh, Russell's point is right, that if it's a case that's only in the county court, the question you would have to ask and answer for the panel is, um, to what extent is that really a case of substance? But if you are in front in a county court case and you think it is substance and you're in front of one of the local judges who could be expecting to hear high court cases, then that judge is in as good a position in a county court case to assess your advocacy as in a high court case. So if it gets over the threshold, um, we're then looking to say, well, is this assessor someone who we would expect really to, to, to be able to understand what to expect of a silk? And that, the judge in that position absolutely would. Thank you. Um, whilst you're both still there, there's the question at the end about gender imbalance and diversity figures. Um, I didn't uh, specifically raise this with you ahead of this meeting, but are you able to give us any views on where we are with that, that aspect of the applications? Andrew? I think Russell was trying to answer that. Oh, I'm so sorry. 
I thought you were nodding. Um, I was failing to unmute. Um, well, I mean, the most recent figures are really very encouraging. Last year, 35% of those appointed were women, which, uh, using BSB figures, is within a percentage point or two of the proportion of women in uh, the relevant cohort. In other words, um, barristers of 15 to 30 years call. Um, something like almost 60% of women who applied were successful, um, as opposed to 40% of men, um, which means, if you like, that women's greater success rate makes up for um, their comparatively low rate of application. So, I mean, if it carries on like that, and there's no guarantee that it will, um, you would say there's no evidence of a problem within the QC process. Women are getting appointed um, in very close uh, proximity to their representation amongst barristers of the relevant length of call. And that's been getting that's been improving year on year and yet last year was a record both in terms of the number of women appointed and the proportion they recommend they represented of all appointments. Thank you. Is there anybody else on the panel who wants to make any points about the gender imbalance or the diversity figures? Uh, Dixon, you, you have your hand up, please to go ahead. Yes, just a few things. So firstly, on, on the diversity, I mean, looking at the statistics, there's a whole page dedicated to this year's report about that, and I'd suggest that anybody concerned would read it. Uh, I think uh, I, I'm a, a gay woman and I applied, and I think what held me back was not any sense that uh, the process would not be, would be against me or be in any way in my favour, but just perhaps a lack of looking ahead and seeing people like me. Uh, so I suppose the world, the world is changing and the diversity statistics really bear that out. But if I can turn full circle back to the first question, which was, are you ready for the role? Uh, I agree with everything that's been said, started to realise those in cases against silks, started to realise those in cases where it was appropriate for me to have a junior. But I also needed a bit of a kick, frankly, uh, and from people I trusted within chambers and out of chambers to turn around and ask me why I hadn't applied and when I was thinking of applying. And that's what I needed to get me going because I knew it was going to be a fairly arduous process. And to pick up on something which Mrs Justice O'Farrell said, having had that kick, I did then get organised and I was then looking at it over a sort of two year horizon, I suppose. Uh, and just picking up on some of the questions I can see, um, firstly about what I did every time I waited until the case was over, waited a matter of weeks and then wrote a very carefully worded and painstakingly worried over letter to each of them. Uh, and, and I took a lot of, uh, it helped a lot getting the responses to give me the confidence to carry on. Uh, and in terms of, can I see there's a can of substantive hearing before a master or ICC judge be a suitable case? Um, I think you have to think very carefully, I know I did, about covering your competencies and getting cases which can be characterised as significant but also can cover the competencies. Uh, and so I did have a hearing before a master because for various strange reasons it involved cross-examination. And I had a few cases which involved that, but I was quite keen to boost that part of my application. Uh, but I also had two mediations on my form. And in terms of the range of judges, say, I did have a court of appeal judge, which sounds excellent, but I was only on my feet for 40 minutes. So in any other case, I wouldn't have thought that that was sufficient, but it was sufficient because it was a case of particular significance. Uh, so I know I've answered a number of points there, Sean, but I hope that helped. That's Great. <laughs> very, very helpful. Um, I'm going to pick up a couple of the questions and this, a lot of these go to similar points. Um, somebody's asked kind of substantive hearing before a master or an ICC judge, such as a, a day long strikeout application, be it, be a suitable case. My, my immediate reaction would be yes. It's always a balance between the substance and the case, the nature of your role and what the assessor is going to have an opportunity to say about you. You have to take those into account in every case. Of course, um, it is likely to have greater weight if it comes from a judge who is seeing silks regularly in cases that are justifying a, the, a high court judge or a senior circuit judge dealing, dealing with them. But don't rule cases out automatically because they're something else. Think about those three factors, the substance of the case, what your role is, uh, and what the assessor is going to be able to say about you. Perhaps I might add just on that, as was suggested before, 
approach your leader if you're being led in a case. There's no reason why in principle, subject to, to client agreement and your leader being happy with it, that you shouldn't take a witness or two in a long trial. Yet there will always be the more important witnesses that your leader will really be obliged to take, but there may be others where you can, you can add something that will just enable that judge to have something else to say about you. Whether it's significant enough is, a, is part of the, the assessment you then have to make afterwards. There's, there's one question that I, I think is um, really to do with the, the, the judge and whether they can be an assessor, which is when you ha are appearing before dispute boards, um, and particularly uh, dispute adjudication boards on construction cases. Um, so you have a, a, a mix of people's qualifications. They're not all lawyers and they may well be very experienced in their fields, but they are not judicial in that sense. Um, I can probably answer that. Um, the difficulty we have with anyone in that position is assessing the extent to which they understand what it is that we expect of silks in our system. The, the guidance does deal with the position of those who have international arbitration practices, where you get a wide, quite a wide range of arbitrators sitting, some of them from a common law jurisdiction, so they have a better understanding, some from civil law jurisdictions, but who do with, deal with a lot of arbitrations. It really does depend on how reliably that assessor is going to be able to comment on the skill sets that are needed and how well you met those skills. So for anyone in that position or indeed a similar position, I'd say look at the guidance we give about those with international practices and work out what sort of dispute resolution procedure you've been in is going to be able to generate the right evidence, generate the evidence of the competencies because some of these um, mechanisms are far more written based than orally based. Um, and work out whether we, as the panel, are going to be able to feel comfortable that that assessment is a reliable assessment in the, of a similar level to someone, say, one of the High Court judges here, making expressing a view about someone who's in silk, um, who will be seeing silks more regularly and, and, and familiar with that. Thank you, Andrew. Um, there, there is another question, which is, uh, what if much of your practice is advisory or written? You do unavoidably need some oral advocacy. Um, you don't need necessarily need a great deal, um, but you have to be able to show some evidence of excellence in oral advocacy, and that's clear from uh, the guidance to applicants. Um, the, the panel doesn't necessarily weight oral and written equally. It's likely to give more weight to whichever um, branch of advocacy is more significant in your practice, uh, but you can't get appointed with no experience of oral advocacy. So if your practice doesn't give you any, then you probably better do some pro bono work because you can't be appointed without some. That's that's an interesting point. I recall on one panel when we had Mr. Justice Knowles and he was encouraging people to do clips um, because that gives you some opportunity for oral advocacy. I, I didn't manage to get enough of a substantive hearing out of clips to be able to, to, to even think about it for that reason. In fact, it hadn't occurred to me until after I'd applied. I, I, my experience of that was, was attending and then having to attend the next day because a, a interim injunction was actually relisted for hearing the very next day. And I, I had uh, signed up for clips for two consecutive days, but they were very brief hearings. Um, so it, it, it didn't seem that, that substantive, but it, 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 did, it did seem to me that a, a volunteer pro bono area like CLIPS that's crying out for assistance. And then if you combine that with advocates who can't get advocacy experience, um, we, we have a solution. Um, there's an interesting question from a clerk here. Um, how, he's often asked how best to approach a judge following a hearing to request a reference. And of course, you have the self-assessment part of your form. And if you feel that some aspect of a, how you dealt with a case as a, as a deputy judge is relevant, or indeed on the diversity side of the form, where we're not dealing with your role as an advocate as such, then by all means, put it in your self-assessment. But in terms of um, putting it in your cases and the purpose of the cases, as much as anything, is to enable us to get assessments from people. Um, it, the reason you can't put it as a case is it doesn't give us a judicial assessor to ask about you and it doesn't give us an assessor to ask about your, your advocacy. Um, so you can use it, but not as part of your 12 cases, use it in some other way. Can I ask, um, this is a pure numbers based question and um, 
I totally understand it can't be addressed fully, but um, it's 12 cases and that's the, the maximum, but obviously not everybody puts forward 12 cases. Um, what's the lowest number of cases that you have seen with a successful applicant? That is three, but it was a long time ago um, and it was from somebody all of whose work was in very major public inquiries, you know, arms to Iraq and something. Um, so there were, there were a couple like that. But I would say that the lowest number that succeeds most years is probably seven or eight. And so somebody whose practice focuses around public inquiries, um, I mean, here's a, a suggestion. Can such a public inquiry that you're, you're thinking of um, allow you to put forward more than one judicial assessor, more than one um, uh, practitioner assessor and so on, because they are so lengthy and they involve so many people and witnesses? You can list two ju judicial assessors and two practitioner assessors in any event, yes. So as a, as a, as a normal matter, you can, if you want to, um, list, for example, your leader and your opponent or whatever. One of the difficulties, though, for the panel, if you do that, is that if we have all your assessments from one case, how are we going to be sure that you, there is strong evidence of excellence? That's in one case. You may have done well there, but can we be sure that's consistent? Um, so you do need to bear in mind that we as panel members are trying to assess a package of evidence, and the narrower that package of evidence is, the harder it will be for us to be confident, as we need to be, that you've met the um, criteria for appointment. So it's yeah. always going to be a balance. And in the, in the so, example I gave, you needed stellar assessments from very high powered judges, in the example of the very few cases. Was that for the three people, three yes. um, case yes. person? Yes. Um, and if you, for example, had um, seven to eight good ones and a few which are, are perhaps lesser, um, is it worthwhile putting those in? As, as sort of make weight or, or just cut to the strong ones? Are you being assessed on your own ability to judge whether these cases are suitable? No, um, you could, you can, it, firstly, it's better to put the list of 12, um, but by all means indicate that, um, you know, your practice has been dominated by these major cases. And although you've listed 12 because you're asked to list 12, uh, the, the others are not of such great substance. Um, and, you know, obviously, if there doesn't appear to be much useful evidence that will come from them, um, we're less likely to go to them for assessments than we are to the cases which will obviously provide um, much stronger evidence. And which are the ones that you are saying would, would, would be that much stronger evidence case? Is it, is it tricky legal points or is it basically factual witness handling? Well, it, it can be either. I mean, I think, uh, as I said earlier, um, the, the more it looks like a case that might, in which your role might easily have been done by a QC, the more it looks like that sort of case, the more obviously suitable and substantial it is. Thank you. Um, if any of people on the panel who are seeing the questions want to jump in, please go ahead. I'm, I'm working my way through the, um, the questions that are here. Um, somebody's asked, is it a disadvantage to have a varied practice so that you don't really have one, one area of expertise? Well, I would say no, that so long as what you do is of the standard required in both or, or all areas or all the areas from the cases you list, it isn't a disadvantage. Um, but perhaps Andrew, as a member of the panel, um, is better placed to answer that one. Um, it isn't a disadvantage, it's potentially an advantage if you can thereby show that you can get on top of something new pretty quickly. Uh, but it depends on your practice. I mean, if you're doing a lot of things and not doing any of them very well, then no, it's not going to be an advantage. The question for us is always, what evidence do we have about your skills? We don't care what practice area it comes from, so long as it's evidence of your skills and we can, we can assess you in relation to all of the criteria. So judge your cases, not your area of practice, but bear in mind that we do need evidence in all of those um, competencies. And if you have a practice that is all dominated by 
um, written advocacy, then you will need to think a little bit more about um, oral advocacy. But I've certainly seen cases where applicants have deliberately tried to develop a different practice strand to try to generate evidence. For example, practice where they think they can get more handling of witnesses than they would ordinarily do. You know, if you're thinking ahead, that's something you can do, and that certainly wouldn't count against you. It would probably count in your favour if you're doing it well. I, I did something similar. I, I expanded um, disciplinary work in order to ensure I was constantly cross-examining witnesses because they don't settle. Or at the time, they didn't. There is now a consent order process for most disciplinary panels, so it, it does rather cut the numbers. But can um, I also say this about that? In Silk, if you're going to be asked to do oral advocacy, you're not doing yourself or your clients um, or probably your chambers any favours if you're not actually up to scratch on these things. You do need to know you can do it and you need to prove to us you can do it. Um, and if by developing another practice strand you can do that, great. But there, is, it, is it sensible to put an application forward if you're getting no advocacy experience? It's not just from the perspective, can you succeed? But should you be applying at this stage if you haven't got that experience? Um. Somebody's asked, how is an application assessed differently if there are fewer than 12 cases included? Okay, um, it's not assessed differently. Um, obviously, we've got fewer, less choice of assessor. If there doesn't appear to be a good reason for the shortage of cases, then we may well write to the applicant to explain why they have chosen not to list 12. Um, but that's primarily to guard against, if you like, cherry picking, deliberately excluding um, any cases in which they think they were less than stellar. Um, but so long as there is no issue of that sort, it isn't assessed differently. Thank you. Um, any panel members want to add and jump in and answer any questions? Sean, I noticed one about negative assessments, which I think it might be quite useful Please. to assess. Um, I, can't, I can't remember whether it's on Q&A or chat now, but it's, it's there somewhere. Um, uh, there's been two, two trends I've seen on the Q&A. First about approaching judges, which I think worries a lot of people. Um, as I said, I did approach every, every judge. Uh, I didn't provide them with any information at the time. I waited to find out if I would have an interview. And when I found out I had, I did then send them usually the skeleton arguments I'd done and the judgment and tried to confine it to that so that I wasn't deluging them. Um, I also asked uh, every one of my opponents or the practitioner referees, uh, and I think that is where some people find some difficulty, and I know I did. Uh, I had an opponent who I was pretty sure wouldn't be complimentary in an otherwise significant case, and when I wrote and asked, I was right in what I had uh, suspected would be the case. And so I then had to make a decision about whether I was going to use that case. And I decided not to, uh, even though I had a, a very positive response from the tribunal chair concerned. Now, I'd be interested to know what uh, the QCA say about that, because I think it is, it, it's a bit of a leap of faith to put down a case where you know that if they approach your opponent, that you aren't going to get a big thumbs up from them. Well, it, it, it doesn't, obviously doesn't help to have a negative assessment. Um, having said that, nobody is ever um, damned on the basis of a single assessment. So even if that uh, assessor had said you were the worst thing they'd ever seen and should be drummed out of the profession, um, and frankly, even if they were the Lord Chief Justice and said that, it wouldn't have been terminal. You know, it's, it's a rule of the panel that a single assessment can never do that. Um, I think people do, and understandably do, um, sometimes not list cases simply because they think somebody is going to be um, unfriendly and they know that that obviously can't help. Um, can I just mention one thing on what you said at the start? I think you said that you sent material to the judges once you heard you'd got an interview. But that's, that's, there's no point in doing that because the judges are asked for the assessment um, straight away, well before the panel decides whether you've got an interview. So you are now, applicants are now encouraged to send written material to judges and actually the the specific encouragement to do it um, comes out of a point which one of the judges made at one of these uh, meetings last year or the year before. Um, but you need to do it, you know, at the time of putting your application in because they'll be asked for the assessment very soon after uh, the applications go in. 
You're absolutely right. I'm completely wrong. Uh, what I did was uh, I waited a couple of weeks and I sent it straight after I'd done the form. And it all happened a little quicker because I heard back from my, some of my assessors saying they had been approached. So you need to be quite on the ball because it does all happen quite quickly after you've put in the form. But you're, you're quite right. It's not at the moment of the interview. I am um, on, on, on a similar point about negative assessors. Somebody's asked a question um, where their practice is primarily direct access and therefore they don't have a solicitor. So they're minus one uh, potential assessor immediately. And then they are um, in cases that they describe where my opponents will not be complementary because of the nature of the case. Um, sometimes that... That, that might apply where the uh, the um, client has previously been the litigant in person and then they've got direct public access. Um, and they're asking for how, how do they deal with this, particularly where they have judges who are in the same chambers as their opponents. Well, so the, we're talking part-time judges. No, no. Um, the, the question in full, I work a great deal on direct access cases and not based in a chambers. I therefore don't have solicitors instructing me, but at the same time, I found my opponents are not as warm to me due to my different working practices. I can think of three big cases in particular that are more than worthy, but there are no solicitors. My opponents won't be complimentary because of the nature of the case. And two of some of the judges were in the same chambers as my opponents. Well, uh, I mean, the, the applicant could obviously say they are concerned about that on their form if they want to. Um, but having said that, um, we do start from the proposition um, that full-time judges are able to give um, objective assessments um, and are not um, biased um, as a result of links with their former chambers. And certainly um, to look at the assessments you get, then you certainly get some negative ones from judges about people who were in their chambers. So um, there isn't, if you like, a simple solution. It is unquestionably the case that many applicants provide assessments from uh, or list opponents who provide very favourable assessments of them. And probably, um, you know, the single most useful um, practitioner assessment for an applicant um, is a silk opponent. Uh, because if you get a silk opponent who is favourable, then firstly, if they're a silk, we assume they have a decent idea of what the standard is. Um, and if they're an opponent, we don't assume that they were automatically on the applicant's side anyway. Um, but you know, there's no different system for people who um, have direct access. And really, they're just going to have to um, find a way of working with the system there is. Can I give a slight, uh, uh, an added perspective to that? Uh, I mean, I don't find assessors doing the sort of thing that this questioner um, fears. Um, it may be in a case that if you really got on badly with your opponent, um, they might indicate they got on badly with you. Um, there might actually be an issue if you're getting on badly with all of your opponents. But the truth of the matter, the whole purpose of asking for a package of evidence is we get a lot of different views. Um, and if we have one person might well say, I found it difficult to get on with them, but they did a great piece of advocacy. You know, that, that, that gives us two pieces of information. We'd then be testing the didn't get on very well with others. And if it's not reflected in other assessments, it may well be that it, it will be put down to they're just that one person being difficult. Um, you know, remember, we're looking at a package. Don't rule cases out because of a factor like that, or indeed necessarily out of fear at how assessors react, because I don't think we see that in assessments. Most assessors take this really seriously and try to do the very best they can. If anything, we have more of a difficulty with assessors, assessors always being nice about people than we do about assessors um, not being objective about people. So, um, I mean, Russell's right, it takes a bit of management, but I would also, in a more encouraging way, say don't be too afraid about it because we don't really see that coming through in, in assessments. And of course, we're, when we're, the panel does occasionally get um, a hostile assessment from an opponent um, and a favourable assessment from the judge in the same case and the panel is apt to think there that this may reflect a touch of sour grapes especially when it's an unsuccessful opponent um, if you've got the judge against you as well I'm slightly surprised you're listing the case to be honest I can't see why you would list a case in which you expect an unfavourable assessment from both the judge um, and your opponent 
And I suppose you, you, you would have the opportunity to approach the judge afterwards and, and find out if they were prepared to be your assessor. So there's, there's a further triage stage there. Um, somebody's asked a question again about this putting down two judges. If, if your case goes up to the Court of Appeal, um, can you count it effectively as two cases by having a trial judge and the judge on the Court of Appeal panel? Well, it, unless it raised distinctly different issues, it should be a single case, but you can list both the trial judge and an appeal judge because you can list two judges from a single, uh, from a single case. We won't go to, we highly unlike to go to both judges in those circumstances, and we certainly wouldn't go to them if they were two members of the Court of Appeal. Thank you. There's, there's another question that's just come in, which is about um, uh, if, if the, would the panel recommend nominating an assessor who can speak to more than one case that, beyond the, um, the nominated case? So it may be a judge that the, the applicants appeared in front of m more than once. And is the assessor able to speak about those other cases in their response or is it ignored? they're encouraged to speak about the other cases. You know, when we go to an assessor, we want all the evidence they have. Um, you know, we're certainly not saying only talk about the listed case. Obviously, the more substantial and the more recent they were, the other cases were, the better. Um, but we like assessors who are able to talk to more than one case, um, and we very much encourage them to do so. Can I, um, can I jump in on that one too, Sean? The, um, uh, I had this situation. I, I've um, had had quite a stop and start practice as a result of three maternity leaves and then um, another period of work. So I had this problem in my practice that some of the cases that I would otherwise have wanted to rely on were very old. But what I did where I realised that, that one of the assessors in a more recent case had also seen me in a substantial case more than four years ago, I made sure that I included reference to it in the bit that I knew that the assessors were going to see. So I was reminding the judges and my opponents that they had also seen me in another case however many years ago and giving very brief details of it in the hope that if they then remembered it well, they could also add something about that to give a bit of depth to, to their assessment. I don't know whether the panel thinks that was a good idea, but I, I certainly did it with four or five of my assessors. Dad, but don't forget, this isn't just a judicial issue. It's also an issue for the practitioner uh, assessors. Mm -hmm. If I'm asked, as I have been, to, to, to um, provide an assessment based on a case from some time ago, I have exactly the same issues as the judge does about that case. Different perspective, but the memory issue is still there. And the same would apply if I'd been against you in other cases. Uh, I mean, you wouldn't be ask, wanting to ask me while I'm on the panel, but it would apply, I think, to other um, practitioner assessors. Thank you. Um, another quick question about whether you're, when your assessors, your opponents are in the same set as you, what, what impact does that have when you're assessing um, the package of evidence? If, if a lot or most of the cases basically have silk assessors, opponents or high judges that are in the same set? We prefer not to have, well, not so much with judges, but with practitioner assessors, we prefer um, them not to be in the same set. We recognise that there are bound to be some from the same set, but when we're selecting practitioner assessors, we'll take some care to avoid all three being from the same chambers. Um, we're relaxed about one. We probably have a preference not to have two, but we will try to avoid three. Um, simply seen as greater objectivity from outside um, the set, although it's not always to the applicant's benefit to have people from the same chambers anyway. John, can I just jump in on one of the yes. questions that took, took my attention? It says that, can one include cases in which no hearing took place before settlement or discontinuance? Um, I had three, actually, such cases. One was um, a trial where there was a settlement on day one. We actually asked, we went into the judge for no more than five minutes asking for more time because we were very close. So he saw me, but he didn't really hear from me other than that. Um, but he had seen a very detailed written skeleton. It was a complicated case and I was against the silk. So I did include them when I wrote to the assessor to the judge I explained that he wouldn't be able to obviously assess me on oral advocacy and he wrote back saying yeah I think you need to include it um, so his his response was very kind of positive and encouraging and the other two were mediations where um, the mediations were 
not ones where you have a long plenary session. So again, the mediator didn't see much oral advocacy and we were very much spending time in, in our respective rooms. So there wasn't much scope for oral, but I also included those two because there were good examples of working with others, knowledge of the law and, and written. Um, so the answer to that question, I, from my perspective, would definitely be yes. Don't exclude them simply because there's no hearing. But obviously it depends on the substance of the case. I'm conscious that I haven't moved through my slides very much. I'm just going to very quickly, um, just go quickly to the next slide because I did say I would show a case table example. Um, everybody talks about the 12 cases. This actually obviously has 15 cases because when you start off, some cases may end up um, not being suitable. Um, and that was used by an applicant who was successful uh, a year ago. Uh, very quickly looking at the diversity um, slide, I think the, the key point that's come out is that it isn't limited to your, tw your 12 cases. And the interview, does anybody on the panel have anything they, they particularly want to say about the interview? I'm just going to look. Somebody did say they wanted to speak about this. Yes, I, I have no less than four panel members. Um, I think, Simon, if you're still here, I know you're about to leave, but if you're still here, no, maybe we've oh. lost Simon already. Um, I think the interview is actually a really friendly process. I think in hindsight, um, the nerves I had before it were ultimately misplaced. Um, there were two members on the interview panel and it was a genuine sort of conversation and a dialogue for them to try and understand some of the cases I'd put on the list and to also try to understand the nature of my practice. Um, so I thought actually it was a really sort of comfortable conversation and certainly not sort of, there wasn't any worries about people trying to sort of trip you up or catch you out on anything. Mm. Um, I did use a QC consultant and um, I did have a mock interview with that consultant, but I don't think it would have made much difference had I not had that mock interview. And I think um, with credit to the QCA, they actually provide some really helpful information as to what the interview comprises and what you can do to prepare yourself for it. So I actually found that guidance note really useful as well. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Um, the consultant's uh, input, does anybody else wish to talk about that? What they felt they gained? Yes, Miriam. Um, yeah, I, I used a consultant. I mean, you don't have to. And I know that somebody in my chambers applied this year, didn't use a consultant and he was appointed. So it's not necessary. But I felt it was very helpful to have someone along my side, if you like, because I did find it a bit alien and didn't really know. So to navigate the process, I found it helpful. With hindsight, I think I benefited more from the consultant in terms of the interview than I did the form. But that's probably because I'm more comfortable with the written process, whereas interview, whilst you know we're, we're used to all advocacy, answering the questions felt a bit odd to me. It felt artificial to be advocating on my own behalf. Um, and you have to package the questions in a specific way, whereby you set the context of the thing quite quickly, and then you go to the evidence and the, the substance, the body of your example. And I, I took me a while to wrap my head around that. I think I was overthinking it. And once I relaxed into the process, it was easier. Um, but the consultant in the mock interview definitely helped. Um, I'd echo what Simon says about it being very friendly and it wasn't half as bad as I was making it out to be in my own head. I actually quite enjoyed it <laughs> in the end. Yes, I, I, I would second that. I, th I thought the interview was um, a really quite enjoyable um, discussion about quite a lot of things. Can I, um, I've been asked some questions about the, the final slide, which is about life as a junior silk. Um, you, you have all now um, sort of crossed that Rubicon. Um, so you are at the start of this process. Um, does anybody have anything they want to say about what they've thought and what, how it's actually turned out? Well, we're, not, if, we're not there yet, are we? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think technically, <laughs> technically, I think um, I mean I, I can speak about something from personal experience. Um, almost everybody I knew who'd applied talked about have the, having an enormous runoff of junior cases, and what happened with me was my my junior cases about five of them stood up for trial after I'd made my application. So no use for the actual form um, and then had no real legacy <laughs> cases um, running off after I took silk. So there, there was a quieter period for about 
I think it felt like it lost forever and it was about six weeks. And in that six weeks, I was writing lectures. And then as soon as the lectures were scheduled, of course, the deluge arrived. And it, it, it's, it's been a steady flow ever since. Um, and the, the, the split um, is a lot of paperwork, but still some court hearings. Obviously, it's been affected by pandemic. Um, I love the idea of thinking time. I'm not sure I've, I've ever, um, ever really notice that it's it's no difference from being a junior as, as far as I'm concerned on that that front um anybody else about the financial implications anybody think about this when they were applying I know I know it was certainly a feature from from my my own perspective that um I I anticipated a drop or a um a quiet time and so I really wanted to have effectively almost a fighting fund um, to be able to cover all my outgoings and um, happily happily that that worked. Uh, but it certainly caused me to push back the time at which I applied. Um, I'm conscious that we've uh, scheduled the event for 5.30 to 7. So we've got to say another 12 minutes if anybody's um, still got the, the stamina to keep going. Um, Somebody's asked about dealing with litigants in person in the context of CLIPS. Could that be an example for a diversity competency? Russell or Andrew? It, it could give, generate evidence in relation to working with others. It could generate evidence in relation to diversity, but it depends. Yeah. I mean, just because someone is from an underrepresented group doesn't mean that it generates evidence of understanding or proactivity or respect for those in a, in a, in a different uh, or a, a, an under underrepresented group or something of that nature. It just depends on what the, what the interaction is. At the end of the day, we okay. want evidence of the competencies. If you're yeah. dealing with a litigant in person or you're dealing in the CLIP scheme, gives us evidence of those competencies and it's good evidence from the right sort of cases, fine. Um, it may well be that the role of a litigant in person in a particularly difficult case might be such that you feel that case is relevant to put down as one of your cases. If not, it might be something you include in your self-assessment. Um, and it's certainly true to say that when you get to working with others and diversity, your self-assessment starts to take on perhaps a greater role because it's inevitable that the assessors will often be able to say less about that. So it takes on greater significance what you can say. And it is very helpful for us to have good examples um, from you in both of those um, competencies to help to help us to, to fit that into the overall picture of the evidence. Somebody's asked a question about the um, the application of women. I think we've 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 dealt with this largely before. Um, do the panel think that women wait too long um, and and waiting until they're they're really very confident of of that their application will succeed before applying. Do you think there is this imbalance between the confidence that women have in applying and what can the bar do to encourage them to apply? Well, <laughs> you, would think, you would think so, but on the figures, there isn't a huge difference in the age uh, and length of call at which people make first application. Um, there is a slight difference, but not enormous. But clearly women judge it better than men, if you like. I think if there's a if there's a confidence issue, then um, I mean some, the bar is already doing some things about that. I mean I've acted as a silk mentor before I went onto the panel, and a lot of what I was saying to those I was mentoring was just myth dispelling, was giving them confidence. Also asking questions, you know, are, is it is it the right time for you? Just helping someone to think through the pro the thought process you really ought to be going through in deciding whether now is the right time or whether waiting might be the right time. Um, but also just building people's confidence. This, this, the, it's, yes, it's a grueling process in one sense, but it's a straightforward process. And you can, you can encourage people to think about it as a straightforward process if you're talking to someone who's been through it. So mentoring, I think, is quite an important part of that. If you can do it within chambers, colleagues in chambers, do it in chambers. Otherwise, look for other mentoring schemes. Um, there are ways of building confidence, I think, that are there and people need to be using them. This. I think somebody's asked um, a question slightly different to what we've had before, which is, um, is it worth approaching a judge after a hearing now, even though your application may be a few years down the line? I can answer that. I, I did. I mean, you have to wait till it's over, completely over, costs and everything else completely over. But, uh, but I chose to, I think for reasons I've already given, 
uh, firstly, because it's in the judge's mind, and you then have placed it in their mind when you come back, perhaps in my case, two years later sometimes. And also, it gives you a bit of a boost. If you are going through this process and you get a letter back saying, uh, I would be happy to give you a reference, it does give you a bit of a boost to carry on thinking, this is a possibility for you. So obviously it's personal choice, but I did. And I just something not about um, judicial references, but getting references from other practitioners is if you work with silks, what I find useful, partly for boosting confidence, but also just to gauge whether I was at the right level to apply, is you can always get feedback from them. If you've been working together as a team in a case, then I find it useful as I go along to keep a record of who might be supportive and who might not. And also they were quite useful in saying, you did this part of the work. So um, I think that judge would be someone appropriate for you to go and assess. So I think the mentoring that and Andrew mentioned is an ongoing process mm -hmm. and useful to take into account, you know, years in advance of you actually making the application. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm conscious that I am really coming up to the end of the time and I've got at least 19 more questions. Um, <laughs> I don't know how, how they can possibly um, be dealt with, but um, they are here. So I, I will attempt to get them addressed either by myself or I might suborn members of the panel who are um, in my email list <laughs> to get to get some further answers. Um, thank you very much to everyone on the panel for attending and for the um, the detailed answers that you've given and the time you've given up this evening to address all these questions. Um, I know certain questions repeat every year, so I, I really appreciate those repeat members of the panel who have um, kindly and patiently addressed the same similar questions. Um, is there anything, yes, Andrew? Can I just uh, uh, say one final thing? Um, you rightly said, Sean, earlier on that there's a lot of information on the QCA website. Quite a lot of the questions that are being asked are answered by that information. So if you have asked a question, you haven't had an answer to it, do read all of that. And there's one other thing you should read, which is the document panel approach to competencies from the last year's competition. That also has a mine of useful information that will enable you to think about what your cases might generate as evidence. Uh, but I say a lot of the questions are answered by that. So really do read that. And if you read it for this year, but don't apply for a couple of years time, a lot of it will still be current guidance in a couple of years time. There'll be some changes, but the basic thrust doesn't change. So really do read it and start thinking in advance with the benefit of all of that. If, and if you do have questions, you're welcome to either phone or email uh, me at QCA. And believe it or not, and up until about a week before applications close, I will not be busy. People don't do anything until a week before applications close. So any questions up to then, I will be delighted to answer. Thank you. That, that that's very helpful. Yes, the the um, the website does contain pretty much all the information you need to know, and then. Um, other applicants' forms are a great resource, which I think most people have had an opportunity to look at, and it, it, it assists you to know what's required, particularly for sections of the form that, that seem to be um, rather difficult to approach. Um, I think it only leaves for me to um, say thank you to everyone again and to um, thank everybody attending. We've had a, a bumper crop of attendees and a great list of questions. So thank you very much for attending this SBA event and thank you very much to Grey's Inn for sponsoring it and supporting it with in every sense. Thank you very much. <laughs>